Content warning for racism and dubious science. Action! Excitement! Horror! Romance! Thrills and chills! Swords and sorcery! Rockets and ray guns! A dizzying panoply of the strange and impossible from the darkest depths of the human imagination! What mad universe encompasses such tales as these? Join us as we bear witness to the sweeping sprawl of all the history that never was and all the futures that could yet be. It's adventure as you like it on What What Mad Universe. attention was quickly riveted by a large red star close to the distant horizon. As I gazed upon it, I felt a spell of overwhelming fascination. It was Mars, the god of war, and for me, the fighting man, it had always held a power of irresistible enchantment. But as I gazed upon it, on that far gone night, it seemed to call across the unthinkable void, to lure me in, to draw me as a lodestone attracts a particle of iron. Edgar Rice Burroughs, a princess of Mars. In 1877, an astronomer named Giovanni Schiaparelli claimed to have detected long, thin lines on the surface of Mars, lines which he called canals. A few years later, another astronomer, Percival Lowell, uh, speculated that the canals had been constructed by intelligent beings to draw water down from the poles to irrigate the desert planet, and a modern mythology was born. Mars may be a barren rock in the real world, but it's long been teeming with life in the human imagination. It has a thriving ecosystem, living in its deserts, swamps, forests, tundras, seas, and grasslands. It also has a rich cultural history produced by its humanoid and not-so-humanoid inhabitants. It is covered with artificially constructed canals that are essential to sustaining life on the planet. Edgar Rice Burroughs, in his fantastic Barsoom series, codified the tropes and really established what Mars should look like. Not what it does look like, mind you, but what it should look like. In Burroughs' stories, and in, and in many that came later, Mars is an incredibly ancient planet with civilizations older than Earth's, dotted with towering ruins that, and kept alive by the remnants of sophisticated technology from aeons past, but fallen into decline and barbarism. Prowess and battle is the currency, as you would expect from the planet named after the god of war, and both the fearsome green Martians and the supposedly more sophisticated red Martians are ruled by warlords who battle each other endlessly. It's also a planet of romance, where a visitor from Earth can start to change this brutal world, not merely with force of arms, but through courtesy, compassion, and the love he bears for a princess of Mars named Deja Thoris. Hi, welcome to What Mad Universe, a show where we talk pulp stories, both popular and obscure. I'm Philip, and with me as always is Adam. Hello. Today, for the first time, we have a special guest, Jess Nevins, author of the Encyclopedia of Fantastic Victoriana, best known in some quarters for annotating Alan Moore's League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Uh, and Jess, I do want to say this is a huge honor for me to have you on the show. I'm really, <laughs> you were a bit, uh, you know, not to overstate things, but you were a bit of an inspiration for the podcast in the first place. Well, so thank it's, you. Uh, it's really it's really exciting uh, to have you on here. Uh, I, I, I loved your uh, your your. Uh, uh, when when the Encyclopedia of Victoriana was online, uh, I I used to spe that was my TV trope, so I used to browse through it for <laughs> a long time. So and I I'm not poor these days. So you, you you mentioned you were working on a second edition, is that right? Yeah, right now I am revising and expanding the original, uh, making it a little bit more scholarly. Adding in probably going to end end up adding in about 150,000 extra words. So it'll be roughly a quarter again as big. Um, okay. The, it, 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 I'll be selling it as an ebook for 10 bucks, but the, the print edition will have to, will be self-published and run to three volumes since it's going to be, oh. yeah, it's going to be around 2000 pages, I think. So, 
Wow. Yeah, too big to publish as one as one book. But the yeah. the ebook will still be reasonably bright. Wow. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I would love to get that. <laughs> that would be excellent. Uh, like the physical copy, I mean, I would love to, to own that because that would be a huge, that would be a great reference uh, for me and for the show. <laughs> uh, this episode, we'll be looking at Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter of Mars books, but also taking a broad overview of Mars and early Pulp Fiction. Um, I've read a lot of books on this matter and um. Uh, <laughs> uh, not all, but an, I think enough to speak somewhat intelligently on the matter, and I know Jess is an expert on the subject as well. My big question is, do you know, um, who would you point to as sort of the first uh, of the sort of chain of fiction that led to stuff like Barsoom and later? Like, is, is, is Edgar Rice Burroughs surely isn't the first one to kind of write about uh, that, that kind of sword and planet Martian thing, is he? Well, actually... Um... He was the first popular American author to do the sort of planetary romance, sword and ray gun type of novel. There were British predecessors. Uh, a guy named George Griffith wrote uh, a novel called um, A Honeymoon in Space, which had this very British uh, sort of scientist inventor adventurer type going into space with his wife and having adventures on the inner planets um, and really sort of uh, setting the, the type, the character type for later steampunk. But as far as the Edgar Rice Burroughs type of, uh, like I said, sword and ray gun uh, adventure on foreign planet, on, on another planet, planetary romance type thing, Burroughs is it. That's mm. where it really begins. You can, there are all these different types of fiction about Mars in the 19th century that led up to Burroughs, but Burroughs was a really radical break from what had come before. Right. Is that in the sense that he was the one who made it into kind of a swashbuckler with the swords and the, like almost a pseudo historical thing, or is it something else? Well, um, one critic I read called it masculinist, which hmm. there's, there, there are all these different types of fiction about Mars in the 19th century. There's planetary ad adventure where they find out that Mars is inhabited by angels planetary adventure where they find out that where the advent the human adventurers find out that Mars is a utopia um, there's Mars as an advanced civilization Mars is a decaying civilization and then you get HG Wells with a really sort of dis disillusioned reaction to everything that had come before so you've got Mars as a basically rival to the British Empire. And mm. you've got all these novels about psychic romances and psychic projection to Mars. But Right. That's actually... Sorry, go, continue. Yep, go on. Um, but you've got... Then comes Burroughs, who is in a way reacting to the advances of feminism in the previous 12 to 20 years and is writing a very masculine sort of adventure novel. But he's also doing really emphatically genre work in a way that previous works hadn't quite been previous works. And this, this ties into the history of publishing where genre was really being solid the ideas of genres were being solidified right around this time but burroughs is emphatically doing science fiction where previous works had been sort of straddling science fiction and mainstream and burroughs is doing a, a more sort of primal elemental adventure fiction than even 
even Griffith hadn't done it quite like that. Griffith in Honeymoon in Space had higher ideals than to do just adventure fiction, but Burroughs is Burroughs is really embracing the the new genre of science fiction and saying, you know, let's 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 dive right in and run with this. Right. Okay. So, um, it, it would it be fair to say that maybe the uh, the nineteenth century stuff was trying to be more. I don't want to say scientifically plausible, but a little bit more like this could this could happen, and this is more serious. Whereas Burroughs was a bit more. Let's just tell a rip roaring story. Let's let's do a <laughs> like a swashbuckler because I mean, obviously, the fact that they have swords and stuff, and it's it's a it's a pseudo historical. Um, is that sort of the shift that we're talking about here? Or? Yeah, that's part of it. Um... You had uh, the Italian Shia Pirelli detecting canals mm-hmm. on Mars in 82. And then you had, um, you had Mars drawing close, to, close to enough to Earth to be observable with the telescopes of the time in uh, 1877 and 1892. And mm. so both of those sparked a wave of what people thought was plausible fiction maybe not realistic but at least plausible but um yeah i i I, i'd say burroughs is not only sort of revising the terms of martian fiction but also doing away with plausibility as as something he could point Right. Okay. Yeah. That's that's what I. That's sort of what I meant. Because because War of the Worlds is sort of again. There's the there's the sort of veneer of science science fact. I right. guess. Right. <laughs> um, was there something about that particular point in history that made people sort of embrace the swashbuckler? Because I we we we've seen one or two uh, from that era, and it. I I, I mean, obviously, Burroughs was the inspiration, but it seems like. That was one of the books uh, we read, uh, we were looking at as well, was Elita, uh, Queen of Mars, which was the uh, the Soviet, right. I guess the Soviet answer to to John Carter Mars. I don't know if that was literally the intention, or would you say that was true or not? <laughs> uh, yeah, as far as I know, um, I don't remember the author of Elita's name. Um, uh, Tol- Tolstoy, believe Le- it or Yeah, not, that's right. A, Tolstoy. a different Tolstoy, yeah. Um yeah, he was like a lot of the uh, Soviet writers of the of the early twenties. They were trying to do um, basically a, a ideologically Soviet version of American mystery fiction and science fiction and romances right. and so on. So. Um, yeah, Alida and those were sort of, as you say, Soviet response to Burroughs. Uh, as far as what's going on, um, well, there's a, there's there's a couple way, a couple of different ways to answer that. Um, you had economic uncertainty, which drove people to embrace more emphatically genre work you had as as a, a pure form of escapism you had the rise in the fiction magazines sort of making more and more room for genre serials and genre stories in their pages and i i think it was you know the the Charles Fort quote about when the locomotive doesn't come until it's steam engine time. I think it was just Edgar Rice Burroughs' hmm. time. They they were way the world of popular fiction was waiting for someone to write like Burroughs and do a Burroughsian story. And in a sense, I mean, he wasn't. I wouldn't call him lucky exactly, but mm. if he hadn't done it, someone else might have, might have come along and done it. He had okay. he he had unique talents definitely, and no one else, despite a lot of imitators, no one else quite ever wrote like Burroughs. But 
there's, and maybe this is just hindsight being 2020, but there's definitely a gap in popular fiction, especially popular science fiction of the, of the, the time that Burroughs leapt in to fill. Right. Um, yeah, that's, that's actually, um, kind of yeah interesting i i I, i'm probably wrong about this i'm i don't have a you know a solid quote about this but i i think i remember someone mentioning that uh describing it as burroughs had basically read some of the pulp fiction of the era and said well this is garbage i can do better than this and that was what sort of inspired uh his work um is that was that an accurate (laughs) quote or am Uh, i getting that out of the i haven't heard that one about him before but it wouldn't surprise me. There was, after about 1902 to 1904, science fiction kind of falls off a cliff. You've got H.G. Wells doing his thing, but the the great spate of American and British science fiction from the 1890s and the first years of the 20th century pretty much stops. And... It's really Burroughs science fiction contemporaries are really doing almost entirely are doing really crude work. And I wouldn't be, I I hadn't heard that anecdote about him. I mean, I've heard, (laughs) I've heard a similar anecdote about other writers like Richard Marsh and, um, and uh, uh, Bram Stoker and H. Ryder Haggard and Robert Louis Stevenson but I ha- but I hadn't heard that one about Burroughs, but it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah, I I, ha- I hasten to say that might be apocryphal. I just I thought I heard it somewhere that he was that that was one of his motives was just he saw, he thought he could he could do better than the pulp writers at the time. Um, there's um uh it's kind of interesting um when I'm reading um uh the uh, the the second book, The Gods of Mars, um it it really had a very and I'm I'm interested to see if you think I'm reading into it or not. But it definitely seems like it has an uh you know a, a bit of a political agenda. It almost seems to be, again maybe I'm leaping too far ahead, but it seems anti-religious. <laughs> I mean obviously that is the the literally the plot of the movie uh, or the of the story. But it's um you know they 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 literally go oh yeah religion is keeping you down with this superstition and it's all a big lie. Uh, do you think Burroughs was trying to say something with that specifically, or was that just a handy plot? I'd have to look into his biography deeper, but certainly that's a, a reasonable deduction to take away from the book because, like you say, it is religion is one big fraud on Mars, and mm-hmm. it it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a great leap to say that that was that was Burroughs' message, but you. I, I, I sort of wonder if if how much of a Protestant Burroughs was and whether he me- meant that to be a jab at the Catholic Church rather than religion in general. Yeah, that, that's also possible, of course. Whenever you see that kind of thing, yeah. you have to wonder uh, what it, what the meaning is of that. Um, it, 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 there does seem to be something about Mars story. Obviously, any story set on another planet, and I guess Mars is just the one that captured the popular imagination and it's... I mean, plausibly the one that we could reach and is in some ways the one most, you know, the, the one I guess people could see. It, unlike Venus, it didn't have this heavy atmosphere. Uh, it seems to trigger that sort of Gulliver's Travels thing, that Swiftian thing, and people turn them into, you know, political satires and commentary on, you know, on life on Earth. Is, you know, it, there, there seem to be a lot of stories like that from around that period. Would you say that's accurate? Um, yeah, it actually, um, there, there's a great book on the topic, uh, called Imagining Mars that if you're really into this stuff is, is worth looking up. Um, that's where I got a lot of my information from. Um, yeah, I've read bits of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the satire, the, Use of Mars's satire began in in the 1830s with the arrival of Halley's Comet. That got people really interested in the planets of the inner system and got people surveying the heavenly bodies. 
And so everyone used telescopes and that led to mapping Mars, which led to fiction about Mars, which led to satire about Mars. So oh. there, there's a lot of satire in the 1890s, but it really, it really got started in the 1830s. And so you've got this twin impulse through a lot of the 19th century where Mars is used for satirical and political purposes, whereas Mars, as opposed to plain old fiction about Mars, which, like I said, there was utopian, there was adventure, all those different kinds. Right. Okay. What's, uh, what, what are some examples of like utopian Mars, uh, for instance? Um, okay. There was, let me, uh, well, I can name one. Go ahead, Phil. Yep. Um, unveiling a parallel by, oh, this is a hard name. Uh, Alice, uh, Ingelfrit, Ingenfritz Jones and Ella Merchant, um, sort of presents Mars as a feminist utopia. Okay, there was um, Percy Gregg's Across the Zodiac in 1880 was, yeah. a, was a big one, too. Hmm. Um, and there was... A... And then in 1883, this Polish, or excuse me, English clergyman began this series of stories about um, a Martian named Illyrial who visits Earth and then visits the planets, the, uh, the other planets in the solar system. And there are various utopias and various different species and races of aliens and all that. But those are two of the major ones in the 1880s. Okay. Well, sorry, what was that one called? Um, the, the name of the series is A-L-E-R-I-E-L, and the author's last name is L A C H dash S Z Y R M A. Lax Zerma. Hmm. Yeah, there's it's it's definitely like Phil's uh, created kind of a timeline here. Yeah, just I partial. forgot to include that one. I, I do know of it, but oh, I haven't yeah? read it. Okay, yeah. And uh, I mean he's got kind of a timeline. It it definitely seems like it it booms around um, 1873, which is, again, that seems to be when uh, Schiaparelli uh, found the canals, as you mentioned earlier. Right. Um, and, and then, yeah, that seems, it looks like that's a, that's a big late 1890s. And then I guess there's kind of a bit of a lull. And then I guess uh, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs kind of kicks it off again, from what I can see. Um, I know, um, and Phil, Phil knows all about the, these as well. Uh, the, um, the Gulliver of Mars series. Um, or just one book. Yeah. Yeah. Or oh, it's just one book. Sorry. Um, wh when was that, and what what was was that before uh, the Burroughs? Or yeah, that after? was that was oh five, I think, if I'm right. Yeah. Um, it's it's okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it sort of prefigures Burroughs in a couple of different respects, but it's sort of I I I in a weird way I'd compare it to. Bronze Age Marvel as opposed to Silver Age Marvel. Lee and Kirby had a, they had an indefinable something that their successors lacked. And the mm. author of Gulliver Jones didn't have what made Burroughs special. And so mm. it's so, it's a, it's kind of meh, really. Yeah, so, um, I, I would agree with that totally. Adam, did you have a chance to read that I one? I did not get a chance to read okay. Gulliver Jones. No, I'm sorry. The reading list uh, defeated me this time around, sorry. I'm afraid. No, no, that's totally fine. But uh, yes, but you're saying in that analogy that Gulliver is the Bronze Age and John Carter is the Silver Age. Well, <laughs> Is that correct? Yeah, um, even though the timeline is, is tw yeah. twisted around that one. Yeah, I'd, Maybe maybe the the better comparison is is to like 1950s superheroes as opposed to 1960s superheroes. Right. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I get the the general gist of what you're saying. Um, Phil, what's uh, what's Gulliver about? Just give us a quick synopsis um, of that one. Well, it's about a um, uh, military man who gets a magic carpet that wraps around him and transports him to Mars, mm -hmm. and uh, he basically just bumbles around. <laughs> he's not much of a hero <laughs> oh, fair enough he doesn't he doesn't do any swashbuckling or anything or not really i think um 
he would like to, but he's just not good at it. That that was just my interpretation. I'm sure it's not an intentional thing, but yeah, every, everyone, nobody seems to be. I just Phil was saying basically the same thing you were saying earlier about <laughs> just now that you know they weren't hugely impressed with Gulliver Jones basically as a as a story. It seems to have been a bit uh, revived a bit because of a League of Extraordinary Gentlemen uh, put him with John Carter on Mars, but <laughs> it seems like uh, nobody who has read it who I've talked to was like, oh, it's great, you got to read it basically. Um, in terms of uh, satirical and referencing things, did Phil, did you get a chance to read this yep. at all? Yeah. Um, I was, I, one I sort of gave to Phil was uh, the C.S. Lewis uh, series, the Cosmic Trilogy. Right. Um, the, fir- the first book, uh, Out of the Silent Planet, um, which, of course, being C.S. Lewis, it's all a big uh, religious allegory. Of course. Um, yeah. I, I, I get the impression, he's, he definitely seems to have read a lot of pulp, and that seems to be... I don't want to say it's his version of John Carter because it's it's kind of different, but it does seem to have the whole he meets all these different alien races and they all represent different things and it's all a, a reflection on. But that was, uh, I guess, the '30s when he wrote that, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was Lewis was sort of incapable of writing non-religious material, <laughs> and it it. I've never been particularly wowed by them. It, it It's always seemed to me to be an uneasy mix of religious allegory and science fiction. Um, there are, there are some authors you can say that they're the, the storytelling impulse was wrestling with their religious impulse. I don't know how much of a storytelling impulse Lewis had. I, I tend to think that it was hmm. it wasn't something he had to do. It was more something he chose to do in order to get his religious message across, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, he's he's very much a, you know, doing the uh, not Swift in that case, but uh Bunyan, I guess, Pil- Pilgrim's Progress kind of thing. Um but oh. yeah. Uh, I have some thoughts on. I just finished it downstairs, actually. <laughs> um, um, uh, I I've noticed some parallels between that and Across the Zodiac, which is one of the earliest Martian stories. Okay. Right. Um, uh, just in the um, idea of a non, well, in this case, Mars is a non-religious society, but it has a sort of cult of uh, religious people who have their own powers and things, and the main character gets in inducted into this uh tradition Mm -hmm. um so there was religious allegories there also the idea of mars as being without original sin um is reflected in an early movie which i have written down somewhere here uh oh god uh himmel yes the danish uh, one what's that one it's a danish it's sorry you said it was a movie yeah Okay, but a, like a, a silent movie. Silent movie, from the yes. 19th century. Okay. And uh, the Martians are, uh, uh, like I said, without a sort of original sin. They they don't have violence. It's a perfectly peaceful society until humans go and hmm. introduce guns and things. Huh. And that's that's interesting because that's literally the opposite of John Carter. He's yeah. um, he's he's sort of uh, that's something I find interesting about John Carter is that uh, in some ways he's actually. Not to be oversimplistic, but, you know, you've got Conan the Barbarian, who is very iconic, that he's this, uh, you know, he's a man of savagery in a civilization. Uh, and John Carter is actually the opposite of that. He, he's, a, he's a civilized man who comes to a... Uh, and I almost wonder if that was a response to that in some ways, that it was it was the opposite of that, because it's the idea of, well, if a civilized man comes to this uh, savage civilization and teaches them compassion and emotion, you know, that kind of idea... Uh, that's a big theme in, in uh, especially the first book of the John Carter series. Well, the movie I was mentioning came out a year after Princess of Mars. So. Oh, okay. There you go. So yeah, that was part of it's it's interesting. You've got white robed, peace loving vegetarians who meets this pacifist human inventor, and they want to bring peace to Earth, and everyone goes along with it except Kaiser Wilhelm, who gets killed by God. <laughs> Okay, so this would have been during World War One. They were writing this, right? Right. They were making this. Uh, eighteen, yeah. Yeah. Oh, nineteen eighteen. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So, yeah, right. Tail end of World War One, basically. 
Oh, that's interesting. So was that so? You think he was deliberately responding to uh, to to uh, Burroughs there, or um, it, given how big Burroughs was, how how widespread and internationally popular, it's kind of hard to see Martian narratives or narratives about Mars in the wake of in the immediate wake of Burroughs and think that it wasn't a response to Burroughs sort of like, you know, it's, it's the giant mountain you're reacting to it and you're standing in the shadow, even if you don't want to. Right. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like uh, vampire stories after Dracula. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, so, so Burroughs, like, was it a, so I'm assuming it was just an instant huge hit with Burroughs. Like it was with uh, John Carter. I mean, yeah, my understanding is that it was, it was pretty much um, within a year or two. It was internationally known. Yeah, it's it's it seems, and I mean, how many he wrote? What eight books? Total? Oh no, there's eleven. I think eleven. Okay, yeah. Um, and then it's it becomes about uh, his son, correct? That's the the later series after the first. Uh, two books? It becomes about a number of characters. His son's one of them. But okay, yeah. is it what who who else is shows up in the series as it goes on? Uh, well, there's uh, Gahan of Gaythol, who's from a, a diamond rich Barsoomian society, uh, and uh, John Carter's daughter uh, Tara of Helium. Oh, okay. Um. Yeah, there's some other human characters. It gets kind of repetitive after a while. That was the impression I got that he sort of he seemed like he was kind of repeating himself in the later. From I only read the synopsis of the later books, but I got that definite impression that he was just trying to to keep the money coming in, basically. Yeah, that's uh, that's a fair assessment, I think. <laughs> no, wh- I mean, without having read it, I don't want to make that comment. <laughs> I don't want to be too cool well. On he it, but, he was I mean, he was always a competent professional, and he he gave good value for the money. But I think his heart in the his heart went out of it in the later ones, and he was more interested in the Hollow Earth stories and the Tarzan stories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So you think he was more and 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 uh, John Carter came before Tarzan, correct? Right. Yeah, so he so you you think he Tarzan was more of his labor of love than John Carter then? Yeah, um, I mean he's his the town town Tarzana. It it became Burroughs' home. He it didn't he didn't he didn't move to um, Barsumia or or anything like that. He, <laughs> he moved to Tarzana. Right. Right. Yeah. When did they change? They they changed the name, right? For for him, it was, it or did he? How did that? How did that work exactly? Uh, it's it. What used to be his ranch, and then um, because I could see that they would have changed it. Like Tarzan, I guess, was more popular in general. But yeah. was it sort of after he died, or was it like? No, Tarzan was was always more popular than than John Carter's um, and the Barsoom books. Tarzan. John Carter was internationally popular as far as science fiction went. Tarzan was internationally popular, period. You had Chinese Mm. Tarzan movies. You had Indian Tarzan movies. You Mm. had South African Tarzan movies. Um, Mm. It it was just, as as far as uh, primal archetypes, Tarzan, Tarzan is one of them. Well, that's that's another show, of course. Yes, of course. Um, but <laughs> uh, Phil, did you want to ask him um, anything? Yeah, else? there's one I wanted to talk about uh, that uh, I don't believe you had the chance to read, Adam. But uh, Journey to Mars by Gustavus W. Pope. I did not know. Right. Phil was threatening. <laughs> yeah, it's quite long, and I hated it. Yeah. Um, but it's also a precursor to Barsoom in many ways. It's got um, multicolored Martians, Martian princess, a uh, well, airships, uh, rapier fights, and all that, but it's it manages to make it all boring. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, that that one we know pretty much for sure that Burroughs actually read. Um, Gulliver Jones, Burroughs might have read, but everyone seems to be pretty certain that Journey to Mars, Burroughs actually did read. And yeah, there there are a bunch of similarities 
between Journey, Journey to Mars and Burroughs' Barsoom novels. But yeah, the um, they're not. It's not very good, and it's all no. this unchecked id and and wish fulfillment and all that sort of thing. Um, Mark Twain once was letting out a string of curses and his wife to shame him repeated them right after him. And Twain said, my dear, you know, the music, but not the note, or, you know, the notes, but not the music. And (laughs) the author of journey to Mars knew the notes, but not the music. It's just, yes, that, that thing Burroughs had, um, the author of journey to Mars didn't. Huh. That's really interesting. And what what year was that? Um, oh, um, 94. It's on here somewhere. Um, 1904? Or, yeah. Sorry, it was yeah. ni- 94 or 95. Oh, 1894. Okay. Huh, that's interesting. Well, you mentioned um, the sort of the unrestrained id, and earlier you were actually talking about how... Uh, that was kind of the mass quote masculinist uh, response to feminist versions of that story, uh, or or uh, I, I wasn't maybe I'm not clear. Were you talking about sort of sci-fi stuff, or were you talking about just genres in general, or well, uh, what what was that uh, about specifically? Well, you, you at two things you had a you had a huge wave of feminist activity in the real world the suffragette right. movement, the new Victorian and Edwardian new woman movement. And so you've got this reaction in popular fiction, like in H. Ryder Haggard, um, against the, against the, the new women against feminism. And you can see it in Dracula. You can see it in, in most of the major um, popular entertainment of the era but also in terms of Martian fiction, you had this wave of psychic projection of women to Mars or psychic projection of a Martian to earth where they get into a romance with uh, an earth woman. And so you've got, when the Mars mania starts in the nineties, there's a, a reaction to it among women writers to write these Martian romances and Burroughs sort of is a reaction to that. I don't know whether it was conscious or unconscious on his part, but you've got this feminism, feminine, feminized fiction being reacted to by the Barsoom novels, which are, you know, really heavily masculine. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay. What, what are some of the, the books that were written, the, the feminist books uh, that were written? Um, Du Maurier's The Martian and Marie Corelli's, oh, A Romance, A Romance of Two Worlds. Oh, that rings a bell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's like Marie Corelli's other work in that it's not very good and it really strains the modern reader's patience, but it's part of the whole Martian romance subgenre. Hmm. Interesting. All right. So that's, that's, so basically Burroughs was doing that, but from the more masculine perspective, whereas the others were from a female perspective. Yeah. Um, again, I, I, I'd have to really delve into Burroughs biography to see how intentional it was. It might've been unconscious, excuse me, unconscious on his part, but Hmm. It's when I look at Victorian fiction in the 1890s and the 1900s, there definitely seems to be a reaction on male writers to the advances of the the success of female writers in a hmm. variety of different genres. And I'd slot Burroughs into that pattern. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. That's kind of that's that's good stuff, and yeah, that that was something you know where I'm. I, I, actually, that's actually something I wanted to to sort of delve into a bit more on this show is looking more at uh, female writers. We did we did discuss um, uh, uh, what's her name from Vampire City, um, 
uh, the, Anne Radcliffe. the author who was written about. Anne Radcliffe, yes, exactly. But um, she didn't write that. No, no, but we talked about her a bit yeah. in that context because it was a commentary on her work. And, of course, the fact that there were so many uh, women writers in the Victorian era, and yet, you know, in terms of at least the pulpier side of things, other than, of course, uh, uh, Mary, Mary Shelley, uh, they, not as many of them have, you know... It, at, at least lingered in the popular consciousness, but, uh, you know, um, I know they're out there for sure. And some people have heard of them, but, um, yeah, anyway, um, go ahead. Sorry. No, and, and I write about a lot of them in fantastic Victoriana, but right. they, they, they have, they have tended to be forgotten about by most casual and even a lot of schol- casual readers and even a lot of scholars and critics. Um, right. Whether or not they really deserve to be forgotten, where some of these other uh, male media male mediocrities deserve are remembered, is another thing. But right, yeah, that's that's how posterity goes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no. Anyway, it's it's definitely um, uh, that's definitely an interesting thing. But yeah, just as I say, it, it's always been uh, <laughs> interesting to me how. Uh, Mars is, like I say, just, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, just it became kind of the staple go-to world. And John Carter became, I mean, it's almost impossible not to look at some of the things that, like Flash Gordon is pretty obviously just a, a reskinned version of John Carter, uh, as is uh, Adam Strange in the in the DC comics later in the 50s. He's a more of a obvious spaceman and a little less of a swashbuckler, but it's still exactly the same thing where he's projected to another planet and he romances the girl on that side. And of course, even Luke Skywalker in Star Wars has elements of it, as we've as right. we all know with the uh, with the uh, the Return of the Jedi segment that is clearly homaging uh, John Carter with the airships and Princess Leia dressed as <laughs> Dejah Thoris. Yeah. Um, yeah, about Journey to Mars, and mm-hmm. it's something, just going back a while, but um, something that annoyed me about that book in particular was the lack of imagination in the Martian animals. Like, the Martian horse is just a horse. Oh, yeah. Okay. They're multicolored, but they're um, just horses. Right, right. And same with lions and other animals. Um, I think one thing that really interested me about Burroughs when I started reading uh the Barsoom books is how interesting the animals are while still being familiar. They're alien in some way. Right. Well, I mean, even Burroughs, you can kind of accuse of just, and then like, he's got the Tharks, which are all cool. And then you are the green Martians. And then eventually he just introduces Martians that are exactly like humans, except they're multicolored. <laughs> like that's something that actually, I remember being bugged about when I read gods of Mars originally, it's like, Oh, come on. You're just introducing all these other races of humans and it's going to get really racist. And it did. Mm. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, although not as bad as it could have been given the era, but still, you know, it starts talking about the different races of Mars and everything like that. But it's true. He's got these sort of imagined, creatures with multi many legs and he's fairly consistent about that too he yeah they all have uh, multiple legs there was one book called mr Tr- stranger sealed packet uh which did have some interesting animals but uh it made sure to point out that they all were on the four limbed pl- you know body plan and i feel like even though this book was really obscure uh edgar rice bros might have read and said i can do better than that <laughs> well d- d- yeah did did he say like like he made a point of saying, "Oh no, they're all they were all four legged yep. animals." Okay, well, it, it is true. You know, you would expect aliens to be more alien, but um, yeah, no, the Martian. That's true. Like Martian animals. I mean, it, it seems like there are stories before that, and it, people tended to imagine uh, aliens and creatures on other planets as being basically Earth life especially the humans they'd meet on the other planet well definitely humans then that right. remained right of course um but but even i mean when did we start to see some sort of crazy alien creatures and like is it is was this again was this the starting point across the zodiac no i wouldn't say so across the zodiac which is one of the early ones like i mentioned has some interesting animals in it okay um they're not like multi-pedal and all that but there are uh there's a sort of slave creatures or they've been uh bred specifically as servants and they resemble sort of tall skinny rodents okay or um 
Yeah, that book actually had it that uh, all Martian animals were, or most anyway, were cultivated. Okay. So uh, they were um, specifically made for martial use. In th- this was before the word right. Martian was popularized. Right. But martial in the sense of uh, uh, warlike. The, no, no, the humans. Oh, okay. So th- that book used martial instead of Martian. That That's... Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Because uh, wasn't martial a word meaning warlike? Yeah, but... <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, there was, yeah, that came up a couple times. Uh, the word Marzian came up in a few books. Right. Just Martian with an S. <laughs> Very odd. Are there any uh, interesting aliens, or Martians in specific, or aliens in general, Jess, that, you're, that you know of that might predate uh, the Barstow well, books? Well, you had, there, oddly enough, you had some trips to alien planets in the 16th century and the 17th century where like uh, Margaret Cavendish is a blazing world Mm -hmm. where you've, you've got this really whacked out variety of alien species, but then, then it gets a lot more earth like in the um, 18th and 19th centuries until until near the end until the 80s and then and Mm. then a little bit you've got a little bit of imagination being applied to alien species but it's not really i'd say there are precursors to burroughs but burroughs is the big one in terms of inspiring pulp writers to make different martians and different martian make the aliens really alien hmm yeah okay yeah that 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 would make sense because yeah he, he i i always that. say burroughs really set the tone for what mars should look like right. not what it does but like right. what it should right <laughs> exactly okay uh well let's uh put a pin on that one for the uh for the evening i think uh as we say mars is a very uh very interesting place uh uh phil you want to you want to play us out <laughs> oh okay well that's it for us today I was Philip Rice, Jadak of Thar. With me, as always, was Adam Prosser of the Council of Engineers. And I'd like to give us another special thank you to our special guest, Jess Nevins, Hecador of the Holy Therns. Blessed be your first ancestor, Jess. Blessed be. Um, our theme music was by Jack Fierick, Roy- Prince Royal to the Kingdom of Mantel Utama. And our producer was Alex Ross of the Hither People of Seth. So until next time... Um, Whatever the Barsoomian word for goodbye is. Yes, I have spoken. Yes. (laughs) Oh, yes. (laughs) 